Amen. Why don't you take your seats? Give the band a hand as they go that way and Dorcas falls over the table. You okay there? You all right? Yeah, just checking you're okay. Brilliant. Um, uh, Good Friday for me growing up meant um, we were Methodists when we were growing up, up to the, um, we were 10. When I was 10, well, we weren't all 10. My parents weren't 10. My brother wasn't 10. I was 10. And uh, when I turned 10, um, my mom and dad had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And um, the church they were in, they kind of loved it one week, came back the next week and went, what changed? And the answer was them. And that encounter with the Holy Spirit completely changed their lives. And um, they then moved over a period of time and good conversations, um, moved into a church that actually believed in the power of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and then I got to grow up as in a Pentecostal church. But growing up Methodist meant that this, on a good Friday, we went for a ramble. So we would do church in the morning, then you had a good Friday ramble. And so we would go rambling. I don't know what the difference is between rambling and hiking. I haven't worked it out yet. Apparently there's a difference, but I, I don't know what it is. Now, my brother, uh, who's a few years younger than me, he, he loves to go out walking, and he'll say to me quite regularly, do you want to come out for a walk? And I'll go, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so the, the first time I sort of turned up, you know, in skinny jeans and trainers, and, um, and, and he turned up, you know, in hiking boots, all this gear, and, you know, th- th- everything, like everything. And I was like, I need a trip to decathlon. Because, <laughs> you know, one of my great loves in life is buying sports gear. I'm leaving it in a drawer. Um, and so, you know, we went for, we go for another walk and we go, he says, oh, let's, do you want to go for a walk? So two weeks ago, we went for a walk. Come, let's go for a walk. I said, oh, that'd be great. So we set out from, uh, from where he lives and we, we head up into the hills and I've worked out what he does. He walks me as far as I can go in one direction and then we have to come back. And uh, I, generally, I find myself getting to a point where I say these words, how much further are we going? Like, how much further? So three Mondays ago, we did 24 kilometers. Sometimes I love him. <laughs> how much further? Uh, we're in the end of Holy Week. And um, in that first Holy Week, it was an interesting journey. That Let me be a theologian for a minute, Paul. It was an interesting journey uh, that they went on. And in that journey, you know, Jesus arrives in Jerusalem. And then, and then you get, he then clears the temple. That happens in Holy Week. He clears out the temple. And then you get that moment where he speaks to a fig tree because it doesn't bear fruit. And he kills it because there's no fruit or life in it. And then you get a moment where he sits on the Mount of Olives and he talks to his disciples about when he's going to return. It's this big clue that he gives them about what's coming at the end of the week. And then you get the Last Supper, this moment. And and we're going to pick up in the Bible the Last Supper and we're just going to move on from there. But I think there's a moment coming in all of our lives where we recognize that there was a clue as you sit in the midst of the, of the Last Supper, as you work your way through, as they leave that place having taken communion, as we will do today, that after taking communion, they make their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. I think at the end of a long day, as they're making their way to the Garden, I think one of the disciples would have gone to Jesus. Are we going much further? Is it much further to where we're going? Let's pick up in our Bibles in the book of Matthew and chapter uh, 26. And it reads like this from verse 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. I was reading this a few weeks, thinking about today. And that little phrase, Jesus, going a little further, captured my attention. I mean, it's, it's almost an understatement of everything that's about to happen. That you're in the Garden of Gethsemane. The next act of Holy Week is Judas arriving to betray him. And Jesus, it says, just goes a little further. 
He says to his disciples, we're going to take communion. We're going to sing a hymn together. And then I'm going to ask you to pray with me. But when you've done that, I am going to go just a little further. I'm going to go a little further. And I'm going to pray in such a way for the sake of the world that I'm going to pray with such passion that the Bible tells he sweat blood in his prayers. There's going a little Further, And then he's going to be betrayed. He went a little further when he was betrayed. And you know where the narrative goes there. We know that Jesus then arrested. He went a little further than any of the other disciples. None of them got arrested. And then he goes through trial after trial after trial. None of them went that little bit further. And then Jesus went a little further again for us where a crown of thorns is placed on his head. He just went a little further than anybody else did. There's no one else wearing a crown of thorns. There's no one else who is now being beaten by a Roman soldier, being scourged, being whipped. He's just gone a little bit further. And then suddenly you find him carrying a cross along the Via Della Rosa. He is going a little bit further he is not holding himself back. He is not deciding that's enough. I've done all that I can. He's made the decision. I'm just going to keep going a little bit further. He gets along the Via Della Rosa. They nail him to the cross. The Bible tells us that he could have called down legions of angels. And yet he went just a little bit further. On the cross, a, a criminal deservedly dying for his sins finds forgiveness because Jesus always goes a little bit further. On the cross, he turns to his mother and makes provision for her and he turns to John and asks him to care for his mother and he goes a little bit further than was necessary. On the cross, he goes a little further because the sins of the whole world descend upon him. He's just not paying a price that he shouldn't have to pay. He's paying a price we should have paid. He's gone a little bit further. And then on the cross, he goes that place further so that we never have to go this way. He lets God turn his back upon his only son. There's a separation between the Son and the Father that happens in that moment that was the agony of the cross. The agony of the cross was not a nail. It wasn't a spear in the side. The agony of the cross wasn't even the sin of the world. The agony of the cross was that Jesus was separated from his Father. And he took that little bit further because he loves us. Why did he go further? He went a little bit further for you and for me. You see, when he's in the garden, that moment that he says it goes a little further, that's his Rubicon moment. That's the crossing of the line. That's the decision made. There's no turning back now. Everything accelerates from that moment. But God's always gone a little bit further. In the book of Isaiah in chapter 45, it says, I will go before you and I'll level the mountains. I'll break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. In Deuteronomy 31 and verse 8, it says this, the Lord himself will go before you. He'll be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. This Good Friday, the cross reminds us that God has gone a little bit further. It reminds us, not only did he go a little further, but he keeps going a little bit further. The work of Jesus in saving us was finished at the cross, but the work that he's doing today is still ongoing. He's still working in your life and my life. He's still shaping and changing our worlds. He is still changing and transforming who we are so that we become more in his likeness. He didn't just want to save us and get us over the line. He wanted to transform us so that we could be more like him and walk in relationship with him, the Father and the Holy Spirit and all the power that God has for us. You see, God is always doing more so we shouldn't settle for less. 
Listen, church, God is always doing more. There's always a something more that he's doing. He's always going a little bit further for you. He's always going a little bit further in your life. He's always pushing it beyond where you've been before. If your life's in the midst of trouble, let me tell you, God has gone a, a little bit further than your troubles. Listen, if your life's in the midst of joy, God has gone a little bit further into the joy for you. And every time he goes further, he makes a way for us. Jesus' statement to his disciples was that, I am the way. The people that first became Christians before they were ever called that were called followers of the way. Because everybody recognized that the way they lived and the way they were was completely different to anything going on around them. They were culture shaping. Why are we doing the big gift today? Because it is culture shaping. Because we're making a declaration about what we believe about our city and the people in our city. That everyone has value and should be looked after. That our city should be cleaned up, put back together, made in a way that gives honor to God and transforms it. That everyone's deserving of joy. When we grasp that, we realize, why is that the case? Because God's just gone a little bit further. Listen, he wants to go a little bit further in your marriage. He wants to speak to you as good as your marriage may be or as difficult as it may be. Maybe you're living in the tension of both at the same time. God wants to go a little further. He wants to go a little further in your workplace. Listen, you think you've got favor in your workplace now? I want to declare over you, God wants to take you just a little bit further. He wants to take you beyond where you are and into a little bit further, something more that he has for you. He wants to take you further in your relationships, your friendships, to have a richness of those who are around you that speak life and health and you speak life into their lives. He wants to take you a little bit further. In your kids, God's care for your children has gone further than your care for your children. Uh, God's love for your children has gone further than your love for your children because before they were yours, before they were mine, they were his. So he is always going just a little bit further. In your physical health, God wants to go a little bit further. The cross didn't stop at dealing with our sin. God just opened everything up so that our health, our marriages, in our singleness, in, in our workspace, in all of those things, God could move in power because he's always going a little bit further. Now, in your mental health, God wants to go a, a little bit further than you've been. You may be sat there going, you know, I'm doing good right now. And God's going, you are doing good right now. So good. But I want to take you just a little bit further. A little bit further so you feel a little bit more that he's got hold of everything and he's moving you forward. He wants to take us a little bit further. The time comes where Jesus is just that little bit beyond us. The Bible tells us that the distance he walked was a stone's throw away. He doesn't go so far that we can't see him. And he isn't so close that it's just really easy to get to. He's just far enough that we can keep him in our sights and we can follow what he's doing. The disciples have literally come to the end of themselves. It says that Jesus left them to pray and when he went and left them to pray, when he came back, they were asleep. They couldn't, they couldn't, they were too tired. They were worn through. So he woke them up and said, hey, pray with me. Come on, guys, I need you right, pray with me. And then he left and when he came back, they were... They were asleep again because I don't know about you, but I often find myself at a point where I am beyond me. I'm beyond me. I got nothing else. There's nothing more that I can do. And I, I am reassured that that's the point when Jesus goes a little bit further. Come on, church. When you get to the end of you, Jesus is going to go a little bit further. When you get to the end of your energy, he is going to go a, a little bit further. And when you get to the end of your finance, he, he is going to go a little bit further. When you get to the end of your relationship, he's going to go a little bit further because he is redeeming it. He is buying back. He is bringing it back to all that it should be. 
he's going to go a little bit further because when I get to the end of me, he asks his disciples to do two simple things and we're going to do them both now. He asks them to take communion and to pray. Because when I'm at the end of me, I need to press into him. When you're at the end of you, it's not phone a friend. It's not come up with a plan. Do you know what the first thing to do is? Press into him. We're going to take communion around the four corners of the room. There are stations with juice and, and with bread. And we're going to take communion. Mike's going to sing and just help us reflect on what's going on. And then we're going to come back and we're going to finish this message. If that's okay with you. If it's not okay with you, I'm still going to finish it. Um, as we go to take communion, don't go by yourself. If you're here by yourself, turn to the people next to you or near you and say, hey, would you take communion with me? They will. Here as a family, maybe, go as a family, as a life group. Why don't you go as a life group or a group of friends? Take communion together and then pray. Because when we do those two simple things, I think while we're doing that, Jesus is just going a little bit further. That as we bring things to him, as we thank him for what he's done, thank him for the cross, he's going a little bit further. So as Mike starts to sing and the team are going to stand at the tables to help you and make sure everything flows smoothly, why don't we stand to our feet? Community is open to all of us. Father, we thank you for the cross. And as we take this juice and this bread to remind us of spilt blood and broken body, we proclaim who you are. You are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. And you sacrificed it all for us. Amen. As soon as Mike starts to sing, make your way. Head towards one of the tables. Make sure you go with some people. Please don't do this alone. This is a community thing that we do. Bless you guys. I'll be back in a moment. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. 
Paul writes in 1 Corinthians in chapter 11 talking about communion and giving instruction to the church and he says this he says for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes let me tell you what we don't say we don't proclaim the Lord's dead. Come on. We don't. We're not celebrating an end. Friday is the pause. We pause because we're proclaiming his death, not that he is dead. And, and we're not proclaiming that he died. We're proclaiming everything that's attached to his death. You see, his death, that when we take a cup of juice or wine or maybe in other traditions there's a, a cracker or a piece of something that dries your mouth out incredibly fast. When we take those, we're not remembering a moment in time. The moment in time has been and gone. Jesus, there was, there was really one Good Friday where Jesus died on the cross for us. Since then, we've lived in Easter Sunday. Uh, we're not living in Good Friday. So when we take communion, like we've just done, we're not... We're not going, oh, he, he's dying again for me. No, no, he died for us once for all time. He paid a price and died a death. Once for all time, it was finished in that moment. So we don't, we don't proclaim that he died. We proclaim the power of his death. And we can't proclaim the power of his death without celebrating a resurrection. You see, we're not stopping on Friday. We're pushing into Sunday. We're not stopping at the cross. We're heading for an empty tomb. We're heading for a stone rolled away. We are declaring, we are proclaiming, He is alive. He is risen from the dead and He is Lord. He is the King over all kings. He rules over all things. He is 
our Saviour. Listen, what are you proclaiming when you take communion? What are you declaring when you take communion? I'm declaring He's the healer. I'm making a proclamation over who He is and what He's done because the Bible tells me that those stripes that He got, that by those stripes, there's something that's attached to that. I'm proclaiming that, that He is the healer. What are you proclaiming? A communion, I'm proclaiming over my children that God is His hand upon them, that He's leading them, that He's taking them forward. Now, what are you proclaiming over communion? I'm proclaiming over our church that God is building it and growing it, that He is establishing it. What are we proclaiming at communion? I'm proclaiming over our city and over our nation. I'm declaring that He is the Lord, that He reigns over all things. I'm proclaiming that He is working, that He is changing things. I'm proclaiming over our politicians that God is speaking into their lives. They're going to find Him over our businesses that they're going to prosper. I'm proclaiming things. What are you proclaiming today? What are you declaring? We're going to sing and worship in a moment. Before we do, just stay standing. If you're not standing, why don't you stand and join us? Come on. We love response. We're going to respond to this message in a moment. We're going to do it in so many ways. In a moment, we're going to respond by walking out of the door and going blessing the city because it's an appropriate response to Jesus going further. And if you're thinking, I'm heading home for lunch, hey, go a little bit further. But it's Good Friday. This is the day we do remember Jesus died for our sins.